thoughts. Analog 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 thoughts. Welcome to the fourth episode of Analog Thoughts. We are up in this thing. Episode four is real. It's coming in quick. It's coming in hot. So today is September 22nd, which is International Hobbit Day. It is the day of Bilbo Baggins and Frodo Baggins' birthday. And in the Fellowship of the Ring, it was Bilbo's 111th, and it was Frodo's 33rd birthday. I kind of treat the Lord of the Rings as my religion, <laughs> not really my religion, but I'm deep. I'm, I'm deep into the nerd lore. I have it on right now. I'm looking at, uh, I just started the fellowship. Um, I'm looking at Gandalf arriving in the Shire. I've watched the extended versions countless times, a bajillion times. I've read all the books, um, you know, the Fellowship, Two Towers, Return of the King, the Silmarillion, uh, the the book about Tom Bombadil's adventures, all of that. I'm deep into the lore. But anyway, I digress. September 22nd, happy birthday, Bilbo. Happy birthday, Frodo. And it's kind of cool because uh, today we're talking about Hinduism, and there's a lot of parallels that can be drawn between Tolkien's world of uh, Arda and the Hindu religion in terms of all of the gods, all of the deities, all of the tiers of gods. Um, so yeah, I think that's really interesting. <laughs> um, this one, like I said, we're talking about Hinduism. I know this is episode four and, and episodes one and two, I was doing the field, the questions of the people, of the listeners, but Episode three, I kind of segued into just doing my own thing and fielding my own interests, and I'm going to kind of stick to that format for episode four as well, just because I wanted to explore uh, Hinduism. I wanted to kind of, things have been, things have been leaning towards this sort of spiritual, metaphysical, um, thing. So I've been, and I've been really enjoying that. I've been really enjoying, uh, doing very small deep dives into things like that. It allows me the chance to go on these tangents in my own life where I look up all the, all of this information about stuff I'm interested in and learn new things. And I get to like regurgitate things I know to you. And I think learning about different cultures and religions and uh, modes of thinking is really important. It builds empathy and it builds a broader sense of the world and what people make of reality. And as an artist, it's my one of my big goals to help us understand reality. So why not get another perspective that you might not have considered before? Um... If this is your first time joining, tuning in, dialing in, episode four, uh, I have been harping on about my Patreon. So you don't have to, you don't have to become a pat a patron, but I do have a Patreon. Listening is enough, but if you would like to support in a monetary fashion, um, Go to patreon.com and look for Mount Analog, M-T period A-N-A-L-O-G-U-E. You'll find me there, and there's a lot of cool stuff. You get early access to podcasts if you sign up for specific tiers. You get early access to music and art and things like that. I'm really just getting it popping over there. I only have a handful of patrons, so shout out to all the love from the patrons, I'm hoping to grow that community and sort of build that up a little bit more. Lately, I've been working on this Halloween death metal EP. I've been, all of the writing is done, and now I'm down to the tedious, monotonous uh, 
EQing kick drums and EQing snare drums, trying to get them to slap. And I think they're slapping, and I think that the EP is going to be ready sometime around uh, October, the middle of October. So 14th, 15th, somewhere in that window is when I'm shooting for. It might potentially be out the week before. It's just going to depend on next week if I get all my all of my snares slapping and all of my stuff sounding exactly how I want it to. It's really raw and really weird and really uh, disgusting and gross, and I'm pretty proud of it. It's heavy. It's really heavy. If you like brutal death metal with guttural vocals and really gnarly guitar and just heavy stuff, you'll enjoy it. And if you don't, it might not be for you, but hey, you know, I like to make all kinds of stuff. I like to dabble in all kinds of genres and just explore. And that's what's cool about art. That's what's cool about music. You can dabble in all... That's one of the many things that's cool about art and music. You can dabble wherever you want. You can explore wherever your interests lie. So I hope that whenever it is released that y'all do enjoy it and it does hit a bone with you. Either way, I love Halloween. It's my favorite holiday. I'm super stoked for it. I'm super stoked to... I think this is my seventh Halloween release. I try and do it every year. Uh, I've been making, well, I've, <laughs> I try to do it every year. I've been making music for longer than seven years, but I think I started the tradition seven, maybe seven years ago. <laughs> maybe eighth. This might be the eighth, correct? Uh, you know, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but <laughs> either way, I also just wanted to say I do intend to be a little more consistent with the podcasts. Although I am busy, we're all busy, and I shouldn't make excuses for myself. <laughs> so I'm going to try to, at a bare minimum, put out three episodes a month. I'm going to try and make that four it takes me about two days, not full days of focus, but it takes me about two days to do the research, and then I record, and then I do some editing and some processing and put them out. So it it does take a little bit of time, but I am trying to get to that three-episode-a-month mark, hopefully four, hopefully five, hopefully six. Who knows? Someday, maybe it'll get to one a week. Anyway, let's get into it. We're talking about Hinduism. I am not a scholar. Um, and this religion, this path, this philosophy is super dense and super old. So I know we've talked about Buddhism. We've talked about Taoism. On the last episode, we talked about the book of Revelations. So on this one, I'm going to do a slight, I don't even want to call it a deep dive because you can't really deep dive into Hinduism on, on one episode of a podcast. It would take years and years of reading and and studying to fully get to fully just even scratch the surface. So I'm going to do a deep dive on Hinduism on this one, but I think for the next one, I'm going to explore a topic that's maybe a bit more, I, I think maybe cryptids. I was going to get into the world of cryptids and get into the world of maybe close encounters. So look out for that one on episode five. But right now we're on episode four. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, all of these tangents. I'm not a scholar. I'm just some dude. So it's not possible really to get into all of the um, things Hinduism has to offer. But I'm just trying to build this sort of philosophical skeleton. Hopefully this podcast can, can act as sort of a backbone to Hinduism, and I really encourage you to check out some of the philosophies and some of the gods because it's very interesting. Uh, it's actually the oldest religion on earth, and over a billion people today practice it. Uh, it's referred to it, it's referred to as the eternal tradition. It's actually so old that some don't even consider it a religion at all. They consider it this eternal life tradition. It's like how sand is intertwined with the seas or how birds are intertwined with the wind. And, you know, 
it's, it, they're inseparable. They're inseparable in many different ways um, to the culture of India. And it originates around 1,000... Hinduism originates around 1,500 BC, around what is present-day India and parts of Pakistan, around a place called the Indus Valley. The origins in India, the origins of Hinduism in India itself are intertwined in this huge way, like I said. So even the words India and Hindu originate from the same ancient Sanskrit language. So the Sanskrit name for the river that went through the ancient Indus Valley, where India is today, uh, was called the, Sen- the Sindhu River. And the ancient Persians that lived on the other side of the river, they would usually pronounce things, they would drop the S on things and replace it with an A. So that's how, so they would pron- pronounce the Sindhu River as Hindus River. Uh, then because, <laughs> because, it's kind of a convoluted explanation, but then because language and shit, the Greeks dropped the H and added an I-A, so an Ia at the end, because a lot of Greek words and a lot of Greek language does that. So thus, the Hindu people were known to be from the land of India. I know that's strange, but that is how it, <laughs> that's how it happened. The Sindhu River, the Hindus people, the, the Hindu people, and then the land of India, all intertwined in this pretty big way. So that's more of a thing about their namesake than the religion itself, but I figured it bared mentioning. The actual religion or path or philosophy or whatever you want to call it, Hinduism, is a huge spectrum. Some practice really strictly and have a set of ceremonies and prayers. And on the other end of the spectrum, some have no practice at all and believe in no traditions um, or traditional Hindu gods. So it's like, it's like most religions. There's a huge spectrum of people who are like, I think I'm going to go to the temple or go to the church. And then there's other people that are like, you don't have to go to the temple. You don't have to go to the church. And then there's other people that are like, I believe in this God and that God. And there's some that believe in just specific gods. And there's some that don't believe in any of the gods. And I personally, um, I like Hinduism. I think it's a cool religion. I'm not uh, Hindu by any means. I have some beliefs that kind of like resonate with their core beliefs. So yeah, I think it's really, I think it's a really interesting one. And there's a lot of uh, cool, there's a lot of really cool things that can be extrapolated from the religion. So firstly, Hindus believe in, and this is something that I in a sense, believe in as well. Firstly, Hindus believe in one universal soul. And they refer to the one universal soul as Brahman. And Brahman is kind of like this cosmic, faceless source material that makes up all of reality. It connects us and binds us. It's it's the soup. It's the thing that um, wiggles wiggles between the cracks. It is the cracks and everything else. It's this blanket of eternal energy. If you're, so if you were like a Jedi, this would be the force. This is the thing. It's this ineffable, beautiful, uh, it's this ineffable, beautiful energy that just kind of connects us all. Which if you are a Jedi, if you do, if you do fuck with Star Wars, I highly recommend watching Rogue One because that's, in my opinion, of all of the new Star Wars movies, I think that that one is the best. <laughs> Not to get on a tangent about Star Wars, but I love uh, I love that about Hinduism with the Brahman and the and thinking of it as the Force. You know, uh, where was I? Got on the Star Wars tangent. Mace Windu and Yoda and all of the Jedi's, they'd be like, well, you've, you've, you've lost your Jedi way. What have you done? Um, 
So Brahman is the co- uh, Brahman is the cosmic source material that binds us all. Brahma is the actual god of creation. He is responsible for taking the source material, taking that cosmic goo and shaping everything, molding everything into what it is. So you have Brahman and Brahma. Brahm, Brahma is sort of the physical manifestation of Brahman. And not only do Hindus believe that the, that the cosmic source material, the soul material, um, is a thing, they also believe that, that each human has their own personal soul. So not only are you made up of this celestial goo called Brahman, this celestial goo coalesces into a personal soul, which consists of the Atman. And when your official body dies, your, your official collection of material dies, your Atman will move into another body, which is known as reincarnation or in their more accurately to their translation, transmigration. So, when your Atman migrates after you die, it's based on, like, where, where your Atman's going to go after you die is based on your karma. And the literal translation of karma means action. If your life is filled with good actions, you're more likely to migrate into a better situation after you die, and vice versa. So, basically... If you're a cool person and you're killing it and you're doing really great, you're gonna be you're gonna get reincarnated into a better situation, or you're gonna get trans migrated into a better situation. If you were a dick, you're gonna move down the totem pole. <laughs> and we kind of talked about this a little bit on the first episode when we did a slight deep dive on Buddhism, uh, and talked about moving up and down the into either the God realms or the hell realms based on how you lived your life. All other religions pull from Hinduism. Like I said earlier, it's, it's kind of the oldest. It's the granddaddy of them all. It is the, um, it's the, it's the one that, uh, it's the one that started it all, baby. None of the other ones would have happened without this one. Uh, it's like the hipster religion. I liked, I read, I liked, I like Buddhism before it was Buddhism. I like Hinduism. I like Christianity before it was Buddhism. I like, I like, uh, you know, X, Y, or Z before it was such and such. Their first album was their best album. Damn it! (laughs) In this case, it's kind of not true. There's some, there's some whack shit in uh, Hinduism. But essentially, do good, be be reincarnated into a good situation. Do bad, be reincarnated into bad situations. Uh, what reincarnation's going on? Uh, <laughs> so this next principle we touched on in the first episode as well. And if you study religion or spiritual paths enough, you ultimately find that many of them lend from each other and have very, very similar thoughts and ideas about reality. But the next, princi- <clears throat> the next principle is called moksha. And moksha is leading such a life of excellence that you escape the cycle of life and death and return to Brahman. Brahman is that ultimate life force we, th- we talked about earlier. So this kind of parallels Buddhism where in Buddhism, once you escape the life and death cycle and become this ultimate super hyper mecha being, you reach a state of nirvana and you are able to escape the cycle of cycles of life and death. In Hinduism, it's called moksha, and it essentially refers to more so the path that you're taking, the good that you do, the, um, the way that you're leading your life and the path you take to escape the the cycles of life and death some common hindu prayers which i'm not going to <laughs> i wrote down the sanskrit 
of them and I'm not going to try to pronounce them because I will probably butcher them, but I also wrote down the translations of them. So some common Hindu prayers are, from ignorance, lead me to truth. From darkness, lead me to light. From death, lead me to immortality. Um, Peace, peace, peace. And so these prayers are about, they're, they're, they're centered around moksha. Take me from this false reality of illusion and bring me back to the truth. Bring me back to the centered source material, back to Brahman. The next principle is where we hit the books. So the next principle is about beliefs in the sacred text, the Vedas. And the Vedas explain and explore the essence of reality, Hindu gods and practices and principles one should live their life by. The Vedas are full of scriptures, singing, chants, poems. They're supposed to be the eternal wisdom of Brahman. And there are four Vedas, all believed to have been revealed to ancient Hindu sages, superhuman beings called rishis. And this is in every freaking religion. Like, some god showed the worthy people the sacred cosmic shit. Now, you know, they know they know it all. And angels chose them to share it with the people. And it's the classic age-old story. But it all started here. It all started on the first album. Uh, so the authoritative transmission of the Vedas is by an oral tradition from father to son, or from teacher to student, believed to be initiated by the Vedic rishis who heard the primordial sound. And this is is one aspect of Hinduism I think that is really cool, is the primordial sound. And it refers to nada, which is the concept that instead of matter or particles that make up the building blocks of the universe, it's all based on vibration, which kind of like subtly parallels with string theory, I guess. If you want to break it down to like quantum physics, which I don't, I'd rather not. I read this book, (laughs) sorry, not to tangent again, but I read this book a while back called The Tao of Physics, and it was all of the parallels that exist within Taoism and physics. And afterwards, it was just so much information, because I have a working knowledge of Taoism and a very rudimentary uh, working knowledge of physics, and... Afterwards, my brain just hurt. It's a good book, but I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to draw any parallels between physics and uh, Hinduism right now. Maybe for maybe for a future podcast. I need to start writing all these down. But uh, all these future podcast ideas. But anyway, the nada is the concept. The concept of the concept of frequencies making up the building bo- blocks for reality. Frequencies and vibration. For this reason, music, chanting, singing, uh, poems are all really big parts of the Hindu religion. And I, like I, like I said, I just really like that. I could do a whole podcast on nada, the the frequencies and vibrations that link us all together. I think it's a really neat thing to say. We're all connected by the wiggles. We're all connected by the strange wiggles. Um, getting back to the Vedas, of course, like any religion, they're super dense and they've been studied for thousands of years, practiced by Hindus, debated by scholars. There's a lot of material in the Vedas. Uh, there's an excruciating amount of information, actually. It's when I, (laughs) when I was, when I was doing like some reading and some research on exactly how dense the Vedas were, I was like, oh my God, this could be a whole series of podcasts and you wouldn't even scratch the surface. Hinduism itself could be just talked about and talked about and talked about and talked about forever, but the Vedas are full of uh, full of they're full of ways to 
pretty much guides for everything, how to pray, how to dance, how to conduct a proper wedding. Uh, there's like sacrificial rites. There are literally, there are parts of the Vedas that uh, talk about cursing your enemies or uh, en enchanting your enemies, creating love spells. There's there's parts about how to train horses. There's parts about uh, anything. Basically, these are these are supposed to be sacred texts that were given to the rishis thousands of years ago, and and it's cosmic guides on how to live your life handed down directly from Brahma. One of the coolest Vedas, in my opinion, is the Sama Veda. It's just a songbook and translated the Sama means the Sama Veda means the sweet song that destroys sorrow. And I think that that's really beautiful. I think that's really something to celebrate in any religion. If you have, if you have a book that is all about making you happy through song, I think that's something we can all celebrate, whether you're Hindu or not, whether you're trying to be like, this is the life path for me. I think anyone that's coming at you and says, we have a book of songs that are just specifically meant to make you happy. That's a good thing. That's a good nugget inside of Hinduism. So we're looking at frequencies. We're looking at the cosmic goo of the Brahmin. We're looking at songs that bind us and make us happy and bring us joy. I think it's really cool. These are parts of Hinduism I really resonate with. Uh, another part, another, uh, so I say another part of these Vedas. There are four Vedas, each consisting of many volumes. So I'll just use the reference of the Lord of the Rings because it's International Hobbit Day. I've got the fellowship on. Let's run it. Uh, <laughs> the Lord of the Rings consists of three parts. The Fellowship, the Two Towers, and the Return of the King. Those three parts consist of multiple books within them. Like You can buy the compendiums of the three, but the way that Tolkien wrote them and published them, and it will still say inside of the compendium of the, of the three, if that's how you're reading them, that you're now entering book six, you're entering book seven, you're entering book eight. That's how the Vedas are as well. There are four big chunks, but within the Vedas, there are multiple, multiple, many, many books. And also there are sacred texts that we'll get into a little bit later that aren't, aren't the Vedas, that are these whole other side quests or these whole other, whole other side stories, you know what I mean? <laughs> that are still sacred texts. They're just not part of the Vedas. Uh, but anyway... Another, another one of the Vedas that I think uh, bears mentioning is the Atara, Atarava Veda, which is a Veda that is all about curses, blessings, poisons, how to summon storms, how to uh, call waves to the shore, all kinds of cool stuff. And I wrote down this website I'm just going to click, I'm going to click this website. It's going to take us to the, and I'm, I did this intentionally. I wanted to, I wanted to select a random one and just kind of read over it. So it's, this link is taking us to the Atarava Veda. Take me there. Hold up. I'm going to click. Open. All right. Hymns of the Atarata Veda. And I'm just going to go through a few. Charm against the charm against diseases, charm against coughs. So these there are literally hundreds and hundreds of these charms and these blessings. Uh, possession by demon by demons of disease cured. Charm with the plant uh Prisniprea. Uh, charm for driving away demons. So here's all the charms. We've got how to dispel this demon that's a destroyer of enemies, uh, oblation of the suppression of enemies. Then we get into charm to arouse the passionate love of a man, charm to arouse the pe passionate love of a woman, charm, uh, charm at an 
assignation. I'm not sure what that means. I'm too dumb to know that word. Uh, then we get into praises, battle charm of confusing the enemy, battle charm of a king upon the eve of battle. Damn. So this book, I'm just scratching. Those literally were just a few. There's hundreds and hundreds. I implore you to go look at the hymns of the At, uh, Atavara Veda. There are so many. Some of them are really cool. I'm just going to pick a random one and read part of it because charm to repel sorceries or spells. Whoops. Click the wrong one. Here we go. The spell which they skillfully prepare as a bride for the wedding, the multiform spell fashioned by hand shall go to a distance. We drive it away. The spell that has been brought forward by the fashioner of the spell that is endowed with the head and bowed, endowed with nose, endowed with ears and multiform shall go to a distance. We drive it away. The spell that has been prepared by a sadra, prepared by a raja, prepared by a woman, prepared by brahmins, as a wife rejected by her husband shall recoil upon her fabricator, and his, with his, with his herb have I destroyed all spells that which they have to put into the field, into the cattle, and into thy men. Evil be to him that prepares evil, the curse shall recoil upon him that utters the curses back. Do we hurl it against him that it may slay him and fashion, and that the fat slay him that fashions the spell? So that that's that's just a small <laughs> this has 26 sections, and that got us to section five. So these are really long incantations. If you're trying to be some sort of wizard or some sort of spell binder or some sort of <laughs> mystic, I think that this book, uh, this particular uh, Veda is for you because everything's in there. Everything's in there. I read that there was one that helped you keep pigeons off of your roof. There's one that helps you there's one that's supposed to charm your horse and make it run faster. So there's all of these charms and, and I don't want to say spells because I don't know if that's the right word, but yeah. Moving on through the Vedas. Uh, this actually I wrote but made in an, an addendum to after this, uh, but there's also super weird, super not chill portions of Hinduism and that is that society in Hindu culture should be divided into four caste systems, which are priests, warriors, traders, and laborers. And this part of, the, of Hinduism is notorious for being pretty whack. It locks people into a specific mode of reality based on to whom they were born or to what family they come from. Very whack. But then, uh, you know, I, I always... I always thought this about Hinduism, Hinduism too, and every religion has its whack shit inside of it. And for years, I had thought like Hinduism's tight; it's got all the, all of these musical concepts and all of these ways that reality parallels with frequency. And I really resonate that, and I resonate with the with the life goo, uh, the Brahman, and how we're all connected via this eternal life force, but I never really resonated with this caste system thing, which I had just kind of always thought was a part of the inception of Hinduism. But upon reading a bit more for this podcast, I discovered that that part of Hinduism was added later, like a few thousand years later by this book called, like I said, there's the Vedas, which are the main it's the meat and potatoes of the whole religion, religious text of Hinduism. And then there are these other, quote, sacred books that are part of Hinduism that, are, that were added later. And one of those books is The Laws of Man, Manwu. And this book is where we get the caste system thing. This is kind of like 
where shit gets fucked up, where it's like, if you're from a family that's priests, you too should be a priest. And if you're from a family of traitors, you too should be a a traitor, so on and so forth. If your father's a warrior, you're going to be a warrior. So fuck the book, fuck the laws of Man Wu Wu or Man Wei. I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce that. But fuck that book. It's not part of the first album. It's this sort of addendum to the first album that we get a little later that's on some fuck shit. And I think it all has to, and we're going to get into Dharma here in a second, but I think it all comes back to there is this principle within Hinduism called the Dharma, where if you are, it's sort of this cosmic alignment with what you are. So if you're a lion, you're meant to go and hunt things and kill things. If you are a bird, you're meant to fly. If you are a tree, you're meant to grow your roots into the earth and so on and so forth. So the Dharma is like aligning yourself with your purpose. And I think that's where this book, The Laws of Manwu, Manwu, Manwei got it twisted. And they started to say, if you're part, they took it way too far. They said, if you are a part of a family that are beggars, you too are destined to be a beggar. Or you, if you're part of a group of people who are travelers you too have to travel don't think about buying a house here you got to hit the road so i think that's where things got twisted along the way it's not part of the original uh, philosophy or path of hinduism it got added later and many denominations don't uh adhere to these laws and they don't even acknowledge them many of them do though too so just like all the religious texts and books they've been mutated throughout time new kingdoms pop up new cultures would change society would take things out and put things in and rearrange things and reinterpret things and this is all fairly normal for uh religious texts and religions in general luckily the vedas uh you know, they were like, you can't put this into the Vedas. The Vedas are sacred. You got to make us your own book. You got to do your own thing. You can't, <laughs> you can't put these laws in the text. So I think that's what happened along the way. There was such conflicting um, viewpoints on it that it just kind of got tacked on. And, you know, throughout the years, the Vedic texts also even though they were considered sacred, holy, unchangeable, so on and so forth, they were changed. And things were uh, different. Philosophies were created inside of them. These are huge books. These are like encyclopedic bodies of works. Things got added to them. Things got changed in them. And this created all kinds of different denominations. So it's like Christianity with with Lutherans, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, Baptists, so on and so forth. The same thing happened in Hinduism, where things got added and changed so much that you end up with a bunch of different types of philosophies, Hindu philosophies. Oh man, we're just getting into, I'm, I've still the Lord of the Rings on, it's on, obviously it's on mute, but uh, I've seen it so many times I could probably quote it. I'm not sure, but it's where Mary and Pippin are getting into Farmer Maggot's crops and Farmer Maggot's coming through the field with the scythe and they're like, we gotta go. <laughs> and then I don't. Then they fall down the hill and uh, Mary or Pip. I think it's Mary. Mary, he's like, oh, my back. And then he reaches behind his back and there's like a broken carrot that he pulls up. I'm such a nerd, but... Uh, I love nerds. I love nerd culture. Any anything fantasy, any anything like that. If you got some good fantasy reads, let me know. Uh, send them my way. I want to read that ish. The next concept, <laughs> the next concept. Oh, bless you, J.R. Tolkien. And and for real, if you do want to read a really cool religious text that I think does parallel really nicely with Hinduism, read the Silmarillion. J.R.R. Tolkien's prequel to all of it. The prequel, it's basically the origins of his universe and it takes you from the inception, literally the inception of time all the way up until 
a few thousand years before the Hobbit. So that's where right now the Rings of Power is happening on. Uh, yeah, the Rings of Power is happening and it all takes place. All of those stories are in the Selmarillion. But anyway, I digress. Once again, I could, do, I could talk about Lord of the Rings forever. The next concept in, in the Hindu beliefs is that time is circular and that time is a series of cycles that all fold in on themselves. <laughs> Trippy, bro. bro such, dude, time is just an illusion that folds in upon itself. <laughs> they get pretty specific about their time resets. According to the Hindu texts, time is divided into four pieces. And pardon me, the Krita, the Treta, the Dwapara, and Kali. And these four pieces of time last for a total of 4.32 million years. Once, once we reach the end of our time cycle, inev- inevitably descending into moralless hellscapes of debauchery and wrongdoing, a version of Vishnu named Kali Yuga will show up and cleanse reality of all of the evil and incorrect vibrations. Uh, this is where Hindus think reality is right now, is in the Kali Yuga, is in the last piece of the four-part cycle. And in the Christian sense, this is Armageddon. We are current. And it's not only that they say that, it's like they literally right now believe that the, the Kali Yuga is happening and that we are in our last node of time before the 432 million year cycle repeats itself. Like I said, uh, Hinduism super dense, super, super, super dense with lots of gods, texts, and beliefs. And this is kind of just a crash course. So I'm, I'm giving you the huge nodes when you zoom out, like if you're looking at a, of a, at a timeline or you're looking at a, some cliff notes. I'm giving you some Hinduism cliff notes because I'm trying to keep these podcasts around an hour. <laughs> but I really think that you should uh, look into his Hinduism on your own, at least some of the gods, because there are literally thousands of gods and some of them are really, really cool and some of them are really, really badass. Uh, the next Hindu principle we're going to talk about going to switch oh move my shoulders these podcasts i do it all for you i do it all for the fans i do it all for the listeners i know you're here for me and i appreciate it i'm ruining my shoulders for you can you hear can you hear that that crack those are my shoulders that's what i uh a life of make sitting and making music in all of the capacities and working on editing videos and Recording shit, dust to your bones. My bones. <laughs> uh, anyway, moving on. We already talked about Dharma. So basically, Dharma is being what you're supposed to be and being good. Part of, okay, so let me rewind. Let me rephrase that. Dharma is being what you are intended to be. And wrapped in with that is also being good. Don't be an asshole. Be helpful. Give when you can. Uh, It's more dense than that. But basically, it's be who you're supposed to be and be nice. So basically, Dharma is what creates balance in the universe. The more we deviate from Dharma, the more unbalanced the universe is going to become. And the more we create chaos and despair. So even though Hindus believe that time is moving in this circular pattern and that we're inevitably going to circle back to the Kali Yuga and Vishnu is going to show up and kill everybody, uh, they're still like, yo, be good. So why does it matter? Why be good? Why be bad? Why be anything? And I don't know because I'm not Hindu. I am nothing. I am gum on the shoe of nothing. I'm a breeze. I am the stillness. I am a ghost. I am a god. I am sorry for that. (laughs) Anyway, uh, back to Dharma. Part of what Dharma is, is doing what you were meant to, which we've discussed before. Uh, There are a ton of Hindu texts that aren't 
Vedas, like I said before, that are still pretty significant and hold a lot of relevance to the overall Hindu religion. One of those many books is the Bhagavad Gita. Basically, in the Bhagavad Gita, it takes place on a, on a battlefield, and there's this warrior who refuses to fight. And Krishna shows up and urges him to fight. After a lengthy conversation about dharma and what it means to follow your dharma, the warrior decides he's a warrior, and it's in his dharmatic duty to fight. And Krishna is one of the man. I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this. I'm gonna get it wrong. Uh, Krishna is one of the many forms that Brahma takes to come down to earth. So basically, Brahma, all of all of the gods, from what I understand, can take on different forms. And throughout Hindu stories, they do take on different forms. Uh, they can all sort of use a different form as an avatar for the point they're trying to get across. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Essentially, uh, Vishnu comes down and says, yo, you're a warrior. You got to be a warrior. And he's like, all right, I guess I'm going to fight. I'm a warrior. And it's this big theatrical, uh, very dense story about how you need to sort of follow your destiny and, be the thing that you're meant to be. Hinduism is very Hinduism is very theatrical. There are a lot of things that play out like plays. There's a lot of uh, story arcs, there's a lot of antagonists, protagonists, there's a lot of characters. It plays on it plays out like a super dense Shakespeare play where at the end you're kind of like, I think I got it. I think I know what the fuck happened. <laughs> but there's there's a lot. There's a lot to absorb. So either way, the Bhagavad Gita is super interesting. It's full of cool stories, but that's the main chunk of it. And that's one of the side uh, books. It's I don't even want to call it a side book. It's super important, and it's super um, tied into the Vedas and what the Vedas describe and what they offer. Hindus also believe there are four basic principles to live by to have a good life. Dharma, which we discussed earlier, artha, the pursuit of prosperity and good moral reputation, kama, which is pleasure in both body and mind, and moksha, which we also talked about, which is moksha is moving back towards the Brahman, towards the eternal life goo, the cosmic frequency force to the force, to the Jedi force. And there are also six temptations Hindus actively try to avoid. The want for material things, they try to avoid anger, try to avoid greed, they try to avoid attachment to things, people and power, pride, and or they try to avoid pride, and they try to avoid jealousy. So once again, avoid these six things, follow the Dharma, find a path to moksha, and return to Brahman. Basically, I don't want to say basically in a nutshell, that's what Hinduism is, but a lot of it is that. Follow the six things, follow the Dharma, find a path to moksha, return to Brahman. That's the goal. That's the, if you were going to like try and break it down into its most just distilled essence, I would say that that's it. So although there's Brahman, there's Brahma, which, like we said, is the manifestation of the gods, there are so, so, so many gods. And, yeah, uh, Brahman, which we've discussed and we've talked about, is the creator of all things. He shows up and has four heads. The four heads signify the four Vedas and the four periods of time that encompass a full life cycle. So anytime you see, anytime you see, excuse me, Brahma in this, uh, anytime you see Brahma, he's going to have these four heads and that's what they're going to signify. Uh, there's also Vishnu, which is the grand, preser the grand preserver of the world. He makes sure everything runs like it's supposed to. He's basically the supervisor. He's the guy that says, 
yo, this is supposed to be a waterfall, not a volcano. We're going to go ahead and dial this back a little bit, bring some water back in, take the lava out. What's going on? He's He holds this like disc blade thing in his hand. And he will cut you down. If there's like a demon or anyone that comes and tries to disrupt the Dharma of Earth, Vishnu will show up with his disc blade. It's kind of like in Dragon Ball Z, uh, I think Trunks has these like power discs. I think a lot of them have that. Like, it's not just him. Or not Trunks. Uh, fuck. I'm not a huge Dragon Ball Z dude. Uh, yeah, maybe Trunks. I don't know. So, a few of them, Trunks, Vegeta, Goku. Piccolo, Piccolo probably, I think Piccolo does have them, but anyway, there's the power discs. Whoever is listening that's a Dragon Ball Z fan is probably like, it's such and such, you freaking moron, but yeah, (laughs) people listening who have no Dragon Ball Z reference are like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? But anyway, Vishnu has the power discs. If you come at him, he will hit you with a disc and you'll be cut down, which could be where Dragon Ball Z got their inspiration, probably is. And Vishnu's other hand is a conch shell, which is supposed to symbolize the elements. So this is this is what I was this next point is kind of what I was talking about earlier. And this is where I said I was gonna fuck up by talking about the Bhagavad Gita and on the battlefield who showed up. It was one of Vishnu's avatars, so the gods can, like I said, take their body and put them inside of another body. They can take their consciousness and put them into different avatars and have them do their biddings. So Vishnu put his body into Krishna, and I'm pretty... Yeah, Vishnu put his body into Krishna. Krishna showed up into the battlefield. Let me make sure I'm not crazy. Let me rewind. Look back at my notes. Uh... Here we go. Yeah, Krishna Krishna shows up in the battlefield. So Krishna shows up to talk to the warrior in the Bhagavad Gita, but Krishna is actually Vishnu. I know, that's confusing. I know this whole thing is confusing. Hinduism is very confusing and very convoluted. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> this is the first album. There's a lot to talk about. But anyway... Uh, Vishnu can take his consciousness, put it into avatars, puts it into Krishna, puts it into Rama. Vishnu often shows up as a giant, uh, shows up. Vishnu can show up as a giant snake, as a horse, so on and so forth. So Vishnu can take all of these different, uh, shapes. That's enough about Vishnu. (laughs) One of my favorite gods is Shiva. Shiva is the destroyer. So when you think of Shiva, think of death, skulls, destruction, all of the freaking fire, brimstone, Armageddon. Shiva is responsible for destroying the universe at the end of the four time periods. So at the end of the 4.32 million years, that's when Shiva shows up, and Shiva's like, time to die. Everything ends now. So in a way, Shiva's kind of like also the god of rebirth. Even though Shiva is killing everything, Shiva's also giving everything the opportunity to be reborn. And Shiva has a third eye that he keeps closed most of the time. And if he does open the third eye, it means business. It means lasers are going to shoot out. You're going to die. You're going to be melted into a puddle of goo with no hope for return. Shiva showed up. Shiva was pissed. Now you're going to die. Shiva is also a badass because he wears a snake around his neck and rides a bull. So when the end of days happens, uh, Shiva also does a super extravagant dance. That's how the universe ends. Is this, that's how the universe ends is this super extravagant death dance that Shiva does. And I put this little note here that I think maybe, maybe Stephen King was inspired by Shiva, where Shiva is this God that shows up at the end of time to destroy everything. And I think that Stephen, the way Stephen King is inspired is, by Pennywise, the dancing clown. 
because it's always been my uh it's always been my and i feel like a lot of people's interpretation of pennywise that pennywise is just this manifestation of fear pennywise shows up throughout time in different and and in different forms just like shiva and just like a lot of hindu gods but at the end of the day pennywise is fear penny pennywise is death and Pennywise dances. It's Pennywise, the dancing clown. So I think maybe, uh, I think maybe Stephen King might have pulled a little bit from Hinduism on that one. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. The next Hindu god, and we're, I'm just going to go through a few more Hindu gods, and then we're going to call it a day on Hindu. So if you've made it, if you've made it to this point in the podcast, I really appreciate you. I know that I harp on about these spiritual belief systems, these philosophies, these metaphysical tunnels, and I appreciate anybody dialing into the frequencies. But the next the next god is Ganesh or Ganesha. I'm gonna I'm gonna refer to Ganesh slash Ganesha as Ganesh. Ganesh is the son of Shiva and was born with a human head. Shiva cut off Ganesh's head for some reason. Uh, there's a whole story. There's a very long story regarding that. <laughs> and so Ganesh decides to claim an elephant head. Ganesh is, we've probably, you've probably seen Ganesh a lot. It's the elephant headed, uh, usually multi armed Hindu god. But the reason Ganesh is so revered and there's so many like statues and so much Ganesh swag is because Ganesh is known as the remover of obstacles and is super revered for that, super revered for being a god that can help you overcome. Ganesh is a god that says, you got this, bro. You're going to make it through. I'm going to help you out. So the son of Shiva, (laughs) the son of Shiva, the death god, who gets his head chopped off and takes the head of an elephant, is your homie who's like, you got this. You're number one. (laughs) I just think that's really cool. And if if there's any really religion that pulled from Hinduism, it's the Greek. It's all the Greek gods because there's so many Greek gods, and so many uh, versions of the Greek gods and so many ways that they appear in different forms. We're going to talk about one more. Uh, one more god, Kali. Ka- the god Kali. Uh, she's a badass. She's the god of power, the god of time, the god of destruction, and the god of change. She destroys evil in order to protect the innocent. And she's known as the divine liberator and bestows moksha upon those who have earned it. So in the grand scheme of Hinduism, if you have, if you have lived your life in a way that uh, aligns with moksha and you're able to return to Brahman and reconnect with the ultimate life force, then Kali will grant you that right. She'll say, you did it. Here's your trophy. Here's your, here's your W. Here's your big dub. You're going back home, baby. (laughs) She's also a badass because she slays demons. She decapitates the heads of her enemies. And in some sects, some sects, Of Hinduism, she is revered in a similar way to Brahma, uh, the ultimate divine creator. So some sects of Hinduism revere her as such, as the number one top dog. We'll just say Zeus, or we'll say the god of all the gods. We'll just say that. And that's as deep of a dive onto Hinduism as I wanted to take, because this is getting us to about the hour-ish mark, and I feel like, (laughs) I feel like Hinduism's so deep, so, so deep, that I can only hope to give you a vague uh, ripple of what it has to offer in terms of depth and stories and philosophy and gods, and it's the archetype for most religions. It's what most religions harken back to and say, not harken back to, but it's where they pull their source material. It's the first album. 
it's the it's the album that spawned a genre and why not talk about hinduism expand your knowledge uh gain a perspective on philosophy over a billion people practice hinduism so it's kind of fun and exciting to talk about what a huge portion of planet earth believes even if you don't believe it yourself it's it's fun to read about it's fun to explore and expand your knowledge in any capacity it's it's good to expand your knowledge but i figured we've hit buddhism taoism christianity let's hit hinduism and i'm super happy we did <laughs> and if you if you made it through if you made it through with me thank you like i said on the next podcast i think i'm going to I think I'm going to pick something a little less in the vein of religion and spirituality. We'll probably potentially go cryptids because by the time that one comes out, it might be into October. And I think that's kind of a good, that's a good way to start off October is with the cryptids and potential close encounters and stuff like that. But thanks for listening to my uh, Hinduism journey. Thanks for listening to the Hinduism journey. And I'm going to end the podcast with the grand tradition of a fun fact, because why the flip not? Because the fun facts are fun, and I'm trying to keep them fun, and I'm trying to keep them rolling, trying to keep these traditions alive. Episode four's fun fact is about the, it's a brief one, but it was, it's, a creature that really fascinated me because I hadn't heard of anything quite like this before uh anything that sort of operated in this way i heard about it and i was like what the what what the fuck like uh it's the leaf slug it was discovered in 1993 so fairly recently off the coast of japan and what makes them so new unique is that well this isn't what makes them so unique they eat a bunch of algae and then the unique part is they absorb the chloroplast from said algae. And if you don't know what chloroplast is, it's sort of the biological ingredient inside of the biological mechanism inside of plants that allows them to photosynthesize and create their food from the sun. So these uh, leaf slugs eat all this algae take in all the chloroplast, and not only do they consume it, it becomes part of their biology. And I guess that is called collectoplasty, collectoplasty. And there's only like three, three things, three or four known things that have ever done this on planet earth. So I thought that was really cool too. And, uh, yeah, they they don't they they exist they survive off of eating the algae and the nutrients they get from the algae, but they also survive from the food that they make from the sun after photosynthesizing, after incorporating the chloroplast from the algae into their own bodies. It's this really trippy thing where it's like a half half plant half animal hybrid it's like a solar powered underwater slug and it's just really cool <laughs> if you look up pictures on of, of them they kind of look how you think they would look they're these underwater slug caterpillar type things with all of these biological or like yeah biological looking leaves on their back and they are pretty trippy so they're sun slugs, they're, they're leaf slugs, but they're sun slugs. They exist from the algae, they exist from the sun. They're trippy. They're like something from a dream that you wake up and you're like, whoa, that thing's real. That thing was real, I dreamed that thing. <laughs> ah, we're getting into uh, when Frodo gets stabbed by the Nazgul and Arwen is rushing him off to... Uh, Rivendell so that he can get treated by Elrond before they have their big summon of what, the, what they're going to do with the ring. That's where I'm at in the fellowship. 
<laughs> when I started, it was slightly into the movie. I've, I'm, I've been giving you a brief, <laughs> the briefest commentary on the Lord of the Rings. Happy Hobbit Day. Uh, huge, a huge thanks to everyone for listening. Um, I know that wading through the waters of religion and spirituality can be intense and daunting at times. So I appreciate it if you made it all the way to the end. (laughs) The podcast is still evolving and changing. And I know I say this, I've said this on the other ones, but the format is very wiggly and it's a very new thing for me. This is only episode four and I'm looking for new and creative ways to present the podcast and do the podcast. I still want to do a live Twitch stream uh, podcast that I will record and release as a podcast. I'm just trying to figure out how the format on that works. Uh, I'm going to try and be more frequent. Like I said, a minimum of three a month. I'm trying to move up to four. Tell your, uh, tell your friends, tell your friends, tell your homies that this podcast is out here. If you enjoy it, one of the biggest ways you could can support, and I only say this because I hear it on all the podcasts I listen to, is that you can give me a rating on whatever you listen to. I'm not sure how you rate a podcast on on Spotify, but I know on Apple Music and iTunes and all that, there are, you can you can rate it. Um, once again, my Patreon is at m t a n a m t period a n a l o g u e so if you do want to support in that way it's there for you if you have any critiques any advice if you hate some shit that i do or you want me to do some other kind of stuff let me know don't hesitate to ask um thank you again happy international hobbit day take care of yourselves take care of one another take (laughs) take care of yourselves take care of one another Thank you for letting me ramble about Hinduism on the microphone for for an hour. Remember to check on your mental health and check on the mental health of your loved ones. And I'll see you on episode five. Bye. Thoughts. Analog 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 thoughts.